limits. Taylor series can provide some useful intuition for thinking about limits. For example, uh, you might remember thinking about this limit, the limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x. And one way to think about this is via Taylor series. Right? And what do Taylor series tell us? Well, Taylor series tells us that sine of x, well, it's equal to x minus x cubed over 6 plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial minus. And the series would keep on going. But at least I know that sine of x is approximately x plus, I'll just write higher order terms. So if you believe this, you might try to evaluate this limit by making use of this, admittedly at this point, very vague fact. So what's the limit then as x approaches 0 of x plus some higher order terms divided by x? Well, that's the sort of limit that I could you know, really uh, approach, right? I mean, it's not a transcendental function anymore. It's just it looks like a polynomial as far as I'm concerned or I'm imagining here. So I could uh, think about how do I calculate the limit as x approaches 0 of x plus higher order terms over x. Well, what I would probably want to do is multiply the numerator and the denominator by 1 over x. And I've got these higher order terms, and the denominator just got x. So this looks like the limit as x approaches 0 of the numerator now is 1 plus these higher order terms. And the denominator is just 1. And if I'm taking the limit then as x approaches 0, I'd be very tempted to say that this limit is just 1. And that is not even close to a proof. Well, what's wrong with this argument? Well, basically this is a circular argument. I mean, how so? So I'm trying to, trying to calculate the limit of sine x over x by thinking about a Taylor series for sine. And to find a Taylor series for sine, right, to find this Taylor series, I need to be able to differentiate sine. So what do you have to do to be able to differentiate sine? Well, if you're trying to differentiate sine, you in particular need to be able to differentiate sine at zero. So let me just write down the limit of the difference quotient that calculates the derivative of sine at 0. That's the limit as h approaches 0 of sine of 0 plus h minus sine of 0 divided by h. All right, this limit is calculating the derivative of sine at 0 because it's the ratio of how the output changes when you go from 0 to 0 plus h to how the input changes when you go from 0 to h. Okay, but now how do I calculate this limit? Well, what is this limit? This is the limit as h goes to 0 of what? Sine of h minus sine of 0. Oh, sine of 0 is 0. So the whole numerator is just sine of h divided by h. <laughs> so that's exactly the limit that we've got here just with uh, x replaced by h. So what happened here, right? I'm imagining that I'm trying to calculate this limit by thinking about Taylor series. But to calculate the Taylor series for sine, I need to be able to differentiate sine. But to be able to differentiate sine, I really need to be able to calculate this limit. So, you know, if you're thinking that you're really proving anything by this method, you're really not. I mean, this is just a circular argument. Admittedly, it's a circular argument in a really big circle. So maybe it looks like a straight line, a reasonable argument. But there really is something essentially circular going on here. But the fact that the argument's circular shouldn't stop us from making use of that kind of thinking where it's appropriate. Let's find the limit as x approaches 0 of cosine of x minus 1, that'll be the numerator, divided by sine of x times log of 1 minus x. That's a very complicated looking limit question. Let me try to approach that more complicated limit question by using Taylor series. So let's think about cosine. So the Taylor series for cosine looks like this. Cosine of x is 1 minus x squared over 2 plus, and there's higher order terms. So I'm going to write big O x to the fourth. And to be a little more pedantic, I'll say as x approaches 0. And what does this mean? Well, I don't want to talk about this too precisely yet, but morally, or intuitively at least, you should think about it like this. Cosine of x is 1 minus x squared over 2 plus, you can just think of these as being the higher order terms in the Taylor series expansion of cosine around 0. Now the next term is an x to the fourth term, but there's also an x to the sixth term and so on. So what about cosine x minus 1? So that means that cosine of x 
minus one is negative x squared over two plus more terms of degree at least four. We can write sine of x in the same way. Sine of x, well sine also has a Taylor series expansion, it's x, and then there's higher order terms, right? So I'm just gonna write plus higher order terms starting with an x cubed term. Let's do the log term. Well, log of one minus x has a Taylor series expansion that starts like this, minus x, minus x squared over two, minus x cubed over three, minus x to the fourth over four, and it keeps on going. And I could write that as just minus x plus terms of uh, degree at least two. Let's put the sine and the log term together. So let's see, I wanna multiply together things that involve these big O's. So how does that work? Well, I'm trying to calculate sine of x times log of one minus x. I'm gonna write down a Taylor series for that, but I don't wanna actually go through the bother of calculating out what the Taylor series is gonna be. So I'm just gonna try to multiply together these, uh, these, these Taylor series. So sine of x is x plus terms of degree at least three. And log of one minus x, I mean not everywhere, but at least around zero, is given by negative x plus terms of degree at least two. So now what happens when I multiply together these two uh, Taylor series? Well, I've got an x times a negative x, so that gives me negative x squared. But what other terms do I get? Well, here I've got terms of degree at least three times x. These will give me terms of degree at least four. Things of degree at least three times things of degree at least two will give me things of degree at least five. And I've got x times things of degree at least two, so this x times possibly some x squared terms, that'll give me some things of degree at least three. So all told, what I know is that this uh, Taylor series, when I multiply them together, is gonna start out minus x squared, and then there's gonna be some more terms of degree at least three. I'm not bothering to calculate those, right? They're all sort of hidden in this big O notation. Now we're in a position to consider the original limit. So thinking about a uh, Taylor series for the numerator and denominator, I might be tempted to write that this is the limit as x approaches zero. I've got a Taylor series for cosine of x minus one. It's negative x squared over two plus terms, degree at least four. And I just found a Taylor series for the denominator by multiplying together the Taylor series for sine and the Taylor series for log of one minus x. And that ended up being minus x squared plus some terms of degree at least three. Now I could multiply this by uh, just a disguised version of one. So one over x squared divided by one over x squared. And this will give me what? The limit as x approaches zero of this numerator is now minus a half plus terms of degree at least two. And the denominator is now just minus one plus terms of degree at least one. But what is this limit, right? I'm imagining that x is approaching zero, so these terms and these terms are both approaching zero, so the numerator has limit minus one half, and the denominator has limit minus one. And that means that this limit, the limit of the ratio, is just one half. So maybe at this point you're unimpressed. You're thinking, I could have done that with L'Hopital's rule. And you'd be right. I mean, you could have used L'Hopital's rule. So why are we thinking about Taylor series? Well, the point here isn't just that Taylor series are useful computationally. My claim is that Taylor series are really providing some deeper insight into what's going on. So we're presented with this fact that this limit is equal to one half. And you're probably thinking, who cares? And you'd be right to think that. Who cares that this limit is equal to one half? If a machine told me this was equal to one half, I wouldn't care either. What matters isn't that the machines are telling us that this is equal to one half or that we've got some horribly long algebraic calculation that proves to us that this limit is equal to one half. What really matters here is that this limit is equal to one half for a reason that human beings can understand. We can really comprehend why this limit should be equal to one half. We can think about Taylor series. And Taylor series are telling us that this numerator looks like negative x squared over two plus higher order terms. We think about Taylor series for sine, and sine looks like x plus x cubed over six and so on, x plus higher order terms. The Taylor series for log of one minus x starts off negative x minus, and then there's more terms. And when I can multiply together Taylor series, right, and when I multiply together these two series, I'm getting a Taylor series for the whole denominator, and the denominator then looks like negative x squared plus higher order terms. And now, 
I can bring to bear all of the intuition that I have about limits of rational functions, limits of polynomials over polynomials. And as x approaches 0, it makes perfect sense then that if this is a polynomial, it's really a power series, but if I'm thinking of this as a polynomial that starts off negative x squared over 2 plus higher order terms, and the denominator looks like a polynomial, really a power series, but it's like a polynomial, negative x squared plus higher order terms, well then what happens, right? The limit is exactly the ratio of these leading terms. It's negative 1 half over negative 1. So the fact that this limit equals 1 half, you can understand a reason for it by thinking about Taylor series. Yeah, wow, and that's always the point, right? The point isn't getting answers, it's getting insight. Right? The point of mathematics, you know, it isn't truth, it's proof, right? It's not so much whether something's true, but why is it true?